My name is Casey. Welcome to the iHeart Latin channel, lesson number nine, where we will be talking about verbs. We will introduce first conjugation verbs. We will talk about the present imperfect future and indicative active tense. We'll also talk about some interrogative adverbs. So let's get started. Let's talk about verbs. Um, verbs are the hardest part of any language. Uh, they tell us kind of three main things about what's happening in a sentence. They communicate time, number, and person. So time, when is something, something happening? Is it happening now? Is it happening yesterday? Will it happen tomorrow? Uh, the number of people involved. Is there one person or more than one person? And who's actually performing the action? Is it me? Is it you? Is it them? So those are kind of the three main things that verbs communicate. In Latin, verbs belong to families called conjugations. So remember that nouns belong to families called declensions. Very similar, verbs belong to families called conjugations. We are introducing the first conjugation today. So when you see a Latin verb listed, you usually see four different forms of that verb. And these are called the four principal parts. So you'll see here I have um, two examples. This verb here means praise. This one here means love. So let's look at this one here. It's laudo, laurare, laravi, laratus. And if I was going to translate these four different forms, it would be I praise, I am praising, or I do praise. And that would be if you were answering a question. Do you praise? Yes, I do praise. To praise, I praised, and praised. This is a participle. I don't want to get too much in the weeds there. We'll look at that part much further down the road. And then depending on your curriculum, you may also see a word in parentheses, a TR or an INTR, meaning transitive or intransitive. Again, not something we're going to get into today, but it is important to memorize that along with uh, the other four principal parts. So as you're committing these things to memory, make sure that you're memorizing all four principal parts. It's really important, it becomes crucial in further lessons. How do you know a verb belongs to the first conjugation? Well, just like nouns, if you were to look at the genitive singular, you'd be able to identify which declension that noun belongs to. If you look at the second principal part, so this is the infinitive, you'll be able to identify which conjugation a verb belongs to. So if a verb, if the second principal part ends in A-R-E, it belongs to the first conjugation. And just like nouns, it will always belong to the first conjugation. It won't move around. It will always have first conjugation endings. So now let's think a little bit about these, these, these ideas or these things that verbs are communicating to us. Time, number, and person. So let's think about time. Uh, time we usually sort of um, associate with tense. And verbs, um, verbs have three attributes when it comes to tense. So that is, you know, the actual tense itself, the mood, and the voice. Again, I don't want to get too in the weeds in this video. Um, so I'm just going to kind of explain what these three, we three words mean. Uh, when you see the words present indicative active, unless you're a real grammar nerd, you're probably like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and I wouldn't blame you. Um, present is the tense that we're talking about. So something that's happening right now. Indicative is the mood. There are three moods in Latin, just like there are in English. The indicative mood, which means I'm, I'm making a statement or asking a question. The imperative mood, I'm giving a command. And the subjunctive mood, which is more like a wish or um, sort of a yearning. We don't use it too much in English, uh, but it is very important in Romance languages. So we'll get into that later. I'm not gonna, not gonna talk too much about it right now. And then the voice. There are two voices, just like there are in English, the active and the passive voice. The active voice is where the subject is performing the action. The passive voice is where the subject is receiving the action. It's the difference between the boy threw the ball and the ball was being thrown by the boy. Again, don't need to get into that too much right now, but I just want everybody to know what these words mean so it's not too overwhelming. So present tense, it's happening right now. Indicative mood, I'm making a statement or asking a question. An active voice, the subject is performing the action. So that's what present indicative active means. So when you see that in your curriculum, that's what we're talking about. Uh, number, that shouldn't be too much of a brand new concept. Everybody's kind of familiar with that. It's the same as it is in English, um, singular or plural. And then this idea of person. Let's define person a little further. Latin has the same number of persons that we do in English. There's first, second, and third, singular and plural. But in Latin, the person is expressed by what we call personal signs. 
Here you can see the personal signs in Latin are O or sometimes M for first person singular, S for second person singular, T for third person singular, MUS or MUS for first person plural, TIS for second person plural, and NT for third person plural. Well, what does that mean? If I wanted to say that I was doing something, you would see a verb ending in O because that is the personal sign for the first person singular. If we were doing something, you would see the verb ending in M-U-S or must because that is the personal sign for first person plural and so on and so on. Remember that Latin is an inflected language, meaning that the ending of the words change based on either the role, the job that it's doing in the sentence or who's performing the action. So when we think about an inflected language in terms of verbs, uh, we're going to go into it knowing that the ending of the verb is going to change based on who is performing that action. Um, so if we come back over here and look at our model verbs or our example verbs, um, knowing that I'm going to need to change the ending of the verb depending on who's doing the action, the first thing I need to figure out is, well, what's my stem? So just like with nouns, we can find the stem of a noun by dropping the genitive singular. We can find the stem of a verb by dropping the second principal part, uh, the end of the second principal part. So this is one of the reasons it's important to know all four principal parts of your verbs. So if I look at my second principal part, um, I drop the A-R-E, and that gives me my stem. So in the first conjugation, what I'll do is I'll drop the A-R-E, and that will give me my stem of the verb. So my stem for laudo, laudare, laudo, e, laudo, tus would be L-A-U-D, loud. And then I'll put the appropriate personal sign on the end of this verb here. My stem for amo, amare, amali, amatus would be am. And then I will put my appropriate personal sign on the end of that stem. So let's try putting this all together uh, in a sentence. All right, I have crammed a sentence in over here. Caesar praises the sailor. Um, so let's just start by identifying the parts of the sentence. So who or what is the sentence about? It's about Caesar. So he is my subject. He's the one doing the praising. There's my nominative. Is it singular or plural? Singular. And is it masculine or feminine? Remember that when we're dealing with nouns, we have to remember gender, number, and case. So Caesar is masculine. What's Caesar doing or being? He's praising. So this is my verb. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Can we answer the question, Caesar praises who or what? Yes, so we have a direct object. So this verb is a transitive verb. It's transferring the action of Caesar praising to the sailor. So this is my accusative. There's one sailor, singular, and sailor is a masculine job, even though it belongs to the first declension. So let's come back to this verb now. So let's think about time, number, and person. So just like we parse these nouns, we now need to parse this verb. So time, when is this happening? Praises. It's happening right now. It's in the present tense. So um, I'm going to write present tense. And then how many people are doing the praising? Just one, right? Caesar. Um, singular. And then Caesar. Is it first, second, or third person? So Caesar is third person singular. So really important. The verb needs to match the subject in number and in person. So if you have a third person singular subject, you need to have a third person singular verb form. Very, very important. So just like um, adjectives have to match the noun that they're describing in, in gender, number, and case, verbs have to agree with their subject in number and in person. Okay, so how am I gonna put this all together? Uh, well, Let's start with my subject. So Caesar, my um, nominative singular word for Caesar is just Caesar. Um, verbs tend, tend to come last in Latin, so we'll put our direct object next. So what is an accusative singular masculine ending for nata, natai? It would be natam. And now I come to my verb. So I've got a present tense, singular, third person verb form here. 
So the first thing I'll do is I'll start with my stem, which I've already determined is L-A-U-D for this word. Okay, so if this was a first person singular, so if I was doing something, I would just go ahead and put the O on the end, so it would be loud O. So you can see here, this would be I praise. However, if we're talking about any other person, so second, third, singular, or plural, we can't just slap an S, a T, a mus, a tis, an unt onto the end of loud um, because that wouldn't make sense. I can't say loud tis or loud t. <laughs> I need something else in there before I can put the personal sign on. So with the exception of the first person singular, I need to add back in what's called a conjugating vowel. And for the first conjugation, the conjugating vowel is an A. So I know you might be thinking, well, hang on, you just lopped off the A over here. Why don't you just drop the RE? Some people say to do that. Um, I'm not going to get into it too much, but uh, the vowels will change in certain tenses. So that's why we say you drop the ARE and then you add the appropriate conjugating vowel back in. So for the first conjugation, present tense, indicative, active, the conjugating vowel is an A. So since we're talking about the third person, singular, um, we'll add our A in here, and then we'll find the correct personal sign. So I have third person, singular, the personal sign is a T, so the word would be laudat. So quesar natam laudat. Let's try it with a different person. So let's say, for example, I say not Caesar, but you, singular, so just one person, you praise the sailor. Okay. Again, we'll start out by identifying our parts of speech. So who is this sentence about? It's about you. So this is my subject, my nominative. Um, it's one person, singular. And you, is it masculine, feminine, or neuter? Well, let's pretend the you I'm talking about is uh, a woman. All right, so feminine. Um, you praise the sailor. So tense, let's think about time, number, and person. So time, it's happening right now, it's present tense. So present tense, um, you, that's the second person, and singular, because remember, my verb has to match my subject in number and in person. So if this is second, second person singular, then we need to use a second person singular form of the verb. And if you think about it, it's the same way in English. I wouldn't say, you know, um, they plays, right? <laughs> We, we also match in number in person. Um, it's just that our verb forms don't change that much. Since Latin is an inflected language and the, the ending of the verb tells us who's performing the action, we don't necessarily have to include a pronoun. This is different from English. Um, so if I wanted to say you praise the sailor in English, I couldn't just drop that pronoun. If I was gonna say we praise the sailor, um, and I drop the we, praise the sailor, that changes the meaning of the sentence, it becomes a command and not a statement. Um, however, in Latin, since the end of the verb tells us who's performing the action, we don't need to worry about including this particular pronoun. So I can wrap these two words into one word, and that's very different than English. Our verbs don't necessarily tell us who's performing the action. We have to include um, an identifiable person in our sentences. So in Latin, I'm able to join these two words together and communicate the same idea. Uh, since my verb comes last, I'm actually gonna start the sentence with my direct object. So we've already kind of determined that that word is natam, my accusative singular masculine. And then how would I put you praise together? So I have a second person singular, um, that's my, so if I look here on my person, which ending am I going to choose? So second person singular, this will be my ending. It'll end in an S. Um, I, I, I figure out what my stem is. So I've already determined that my stem is L-A-U-D. Since I can't just slap an S right on the end to the, of that word, I need that conjugating vowel. So remember, for this particular tense, it's an A. And then I will put my personal ending on, and it becomes natam ladas, meaning you praise the sailor. 
All right, let's do one more together really quickly and then we'll move on. What if I wanted to say, they praise the sailor? Well, I just need to change this ending here. So now instead of second person singular, I have third person plural. So if I have third person plural as my subject, I also need third person plural um, endings for my verb. So if I look at my chart here, third person plural, that would be an NT. So ah, <laughs> that's how that sentence would look. Now Tom Laudan. So that means they praise the sailor. So hopefully everybody kind of gets the idea of how to conjugate a verb in uh, how to how to conjugate a first conjugation verb in the present indicative active. Okay, we talked about the present indicative active tense. Let's talk about the imperfect indicative active tense. So this is a tense. It is a past tense verb with this idea that the action is kind of ongoing into the future. So for instance, I, I was eating dinner, but then I got interrupted, but the dinner kind of kept going, or um, I was loving my parents yesterday. I, I still love them today, um, but I am using that term loved as in the past. So that's kind of the idea behind it, something that happened in the past, but has this sort of feeling of something that's not quite completed. So how would I conjugate a verb in the imperfect indicative active if I wanted to communicate this idea of something that's happening in the past tense, but ongoing? I can't use the exact same endings as the present tense. Um, I need to change them up a little bit to indicate to the reader that I'm, that I'm using a different tense, that I'm trying to communicate a different meaning. So the endings that we use for the imperfect indicative active are these, bomb, boss, bot, bombus, botus, bont. So you'll see a similar pattern um, if, if we were just using present, ten, and present tense endings, my personal endings, ost, mustis, unt, Sometimes in the first person singular, it's an M. This is an instance where the first person singular will end in an M, but you can see M, okay, S, T, must, tis, nt. So you see the personal endings are the same, um, meaning that I can still communicate who is performing the action, but we've added something in here into the ending to communicate that it's a different tense. So we call that a tense sign. So for the imperfect indicative active, the tense sign is a BA. All that means is I'm gonna go through the same process if I wanted to conjugate a verb into the imperfect indicative active, these are the endings I would use that I would put on the end of my stem here. So if I wanted to say, for instance, um, let's see, uh, we were praising, I would find my stem, which is L-A-U-D, and I would look here and I would ask myself, all right, what's my subject? It's we, that's the first person plural. Um, and so I would look at my first person plural ending, bamus, for we were praising. I would add, remember we talked about the conjugating vowel, I'm gonna add my conjugating vowel back in, and so, the, uh, if I wanted to say we were praising, the word would be la rabamus. That means we were praising. If I wanted to say, for instance, they were praising, this word, they, is third person plural. So I would look here at my chart, third person plural ending for the imperfect indicative act is, is bont. So instead of la rabamus, it would be Lauda bont. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. And the final tense we're going to look at today is the future indicative active. So something that is going to happen in the future has not happened yet. Again, we're going to have to uh, come up with some different endings to communicate. This is yet another, a different tense that we're talking about. So different than the present, different than the imperfect. We want to now communicate this is happening in the future. So again, we're going to walk through the same process. We will find the stem of our verbs, so we know that it's loud and am. Um, um, and the future endings that we're gonna use are these, bo, bis, bit, bimis, bitis, bunt. So again, you can see the pattern is holding, the personal signs, the personal ending signs say the same, o, s, t, must, tis, unt, but this time I have a bi, 
instead of a BA. So my tense sign is for the imperfect, it's a BA. For the future, it's a BI, with the exception of the third person plural. You can see it's bunt, not bent. Um, and the first person singular, it's bow, not b. Um, but other than that, you can see that that pattern sort of holds there too. So let's just conjugate a couple of words together. If I wanted to say, um, I will love, What person, am I, and am I, what person am I talking about? Well, this is the first person. It's singular. So I will take my stem, which is AM. It is a first conjugation verb. So I'm going to put my uh, first conjugation conjugating vowel in there, which is an A. And I will come down here, look at my chart. First person singular future ending is bow. So it would be... I'm a bull. That means I will love. Um, if I wanted to say, let's see, um, you all, so plural, you all will love. Same thing. I'll find my stem, which is AM. I'll add my conjugating vowel, which is an A. This is not first person singular. This is second person plural. So I look down here on my chart, second person plural endings, bitis. And I will just plug that ending onto this verb here. It becomes amabitis. And so that is how I would say you will love. Uh, so we've gone over three different tenses, the present indicative active, the imperfect indicative active, the future indicative active. So just remember, Latin verbs change their endings depending on a couple different things, um, the time, the number, and the person. Uh, and also the tense. So all the different tenses are gonna have variations, vari various endings, and you just need to memorize those endings. But um, you know, as soon as you commit them to memory, you'll, you'll know exactly what the words mean as soon as you see them. Okay, that was a lot of material. Thank you for hanging in there with me. We're gonna talk about one more thing in this lesson that's interrogative adverbs and the particle ne. Interrogative adverbs are awesome in Latin because they don't get declined, they don't get conjugated, they stay, they, their spelling stays the same no matter how you're using them. So, phew. <laughs> we don't have to think about too many things when we're thinking about interrogative adverbs. We'll talk about ne in just a minute. Uh, so if I wanted to plug the interrogative adverb, uh, the word for where, which is ubi, into this sentence, the first thing I have to do um, is I have to convert this into a statement in my mind so I can label the parts of speech correctly. It's kind of hard to label the parts of speech correctly when you're asking a question. Um, so right now, this is interrogative, but let's convert it into a statement. So if I was gonna change where are you into a statement, I would just kind of flip the words around and I would, I would change it into you are where. So, This is going to help me identify the parts of speech correctly. So if I look at this sentence, you are where, I know that this is my subject. There's my nominative. It's second person singular. Um, and so my verb is going to have to agree with my subject. So I'm going to use second person singular form of the verb sum to be. You are, right? So I am, you are, he, she, it is. So that is our sum s, est, sumus, esti, sunt. So I know how to say you are. If I'm talking about singular, it would be S. If I was talking about more than one person, it would be Estes. But I'm talking about S. So S is how I say you are. And then I just plug my interrogative adverb in. So you are where would be S ubi. OK, so now let's flip it around. Let's go back to the question. So instead of S ubi, you are where, it would be ubi S. Where are you? And it's just as simple as that. So interrogative adverbs are great. You just kind of plug and play. Last thing, the particle ne. If you don't have an interrogative adverb and you want to ask a question, you can put this particle ne on the end of your verb, and that indicates that you're asking a question. So if I look at this sentence here, I'll erase this. Will you praise Caesar? Again, in my mind, I'm going to have to convert it into a statement. So the statement would be, you will praise Caesar. So I would just kind of in my mind flip these two words around. And that's going to help me identify my subject in, my, in the correct verb form. So you will praise Caesar. Um, you would be my subject, right? There's my nominative. And it's second person singular. You will praise. What tense is that? 
Is that present? Is it imperfect? Is it future? Will praise, that's happening in the future. So this becomes a future tense verb. It's gonna have to match the subject in number and in person. So we'll use second person singular endings. And then you will praise Caesar. Uh, can I answer the question, you will praise who or what? Yes, that means Caesar is the direct object. It's in the accusative case. He, uh, he, Caesar is singular and he's masculine. So remember that because Latin is inflected and I can um, communicate the idea of tense in one verb, so I can communicate who's performing the action by the ending of the verb, it means that I can wrap all these words into one word. So because I can do that, I'm gonna start the sentence with my direct object. So an accusative singular masculine ending for quesar, quesaris would be quesarem. It's in the third declension, so this is my accusative singular ending. And then how do I say you will praise? Well, I know my word for praise is laudo, laudare, laudo, we, laudo, tus. I know how to find the stem by dropping the A-R-E in the second, uh, in, for, uh, the second principal part. I'm gonna add my conjugating vowel, and then I'm gonna think about my second person singular future tense endings, so bo, bis, bit, bim, bis, bit, bis, bunt. So I know that it will be bis, that means you will praise. But I'm asking a question, and I wanna let people know I'm asking a question. So I can put this particle, N-E, on the end of my verb, and that lets people know it's a question. So, quesarem la bisne, that means will you praise Caesar? All right, like I said, a lot of material covered today. If you have questions, you can leave them in the comments section. I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Also, if you wanna hit the bell, you'll be notified when a new episode is out. Thank you for watching. Good luck in your studies. Walete.